Hey, it's Sylvan, and this is the Henpen Podcast. Hey, if you stick around till the end of the episode, I want to tell you something. Something big, actually. Like, life-changing for me. And very exciting for the Henpen art form as well. I promise I'll tell you all about it, but first... I'm really happy to release this one-on-one conversation I had with Dave Jones, who you already met in the previous episode of the podcast about Handpan Camp. Something happened to Dave a few years ago that turned his life upside down. And amidst the dark times that ensued that traumatic event, he stumbled upon the Handpan. What happened next? Well, I'll let you hear it from him directly. But it's a powerful first account of something I think a lot of us have had a hunch about with these instruments. That handpans can be therapeutic in some real tangible ways. I'm grateful that Dave agreed to share his story. And I'm really honored to be able to relay it to you. So here is my conversation with my friend Dave Jones. Dave. Where are we right now? We are underground, I think. <laughs> yeah. At least partially. <laughs> so I guess I should explain. We are in Dan's studio. Uh, this is day three of Handpan Camp. And I have the great pleasure of sitting down with my friend Dave Jones it's been cool. It's been a long time coming. We met only for the first time two days ago. Yeah. But it felt like we knew each other. So I'm glad we can uh, spend some time in real life. Yeah, me too. (laughs) So there's so many ways to look at the handpan, whether it's culturally, the instrument itself, the history it's healing aspects. And we hear all of these aspects being talked about, you know, in conversations and online. Um, But some of the lingo that I picked up from you really quickly as we started chatting online was uh, some kind of visceral mind-body response to the sound. Um, And I know that there's a reason for you being sensitive to that. Um, can you tell me about what brought you to the handpan and and what your body and your mind's response is and why? Yeah, sure. And I'll do my best to make this editable later. <laughs> <laughs> Not edible, but editable. <laughs> yeah, I think the the... The handpan for me means many things now, but back in 2018 when I heard a handpan for the first time on February 20th, it um, it meant one thing in particular, and that thing, um, if I were to describe the use of one word to describe it, would be hope. So. If we rewind a little bit, I had in 2015, I experienced um, brain trauma and it undid me uh, inside and outside. And so what is what a normal person is able to experience in the world, the person who has brain trauma uh, experiences maybe a little bit different because the brain is working to heal itself it's damaged maybe in a in a way for me that meant um you know constant migraines and um sickness in the body it's as if you had vertigo or were on a if you get sick you're on a boat in the ocean that you in 10 foot swells and you can't see the horizon but you can't get off and so that was had been happening for years before the handpan and I experienced relief in in different ways, but I was particularly looking by February of 2018 for ways to 
help me experience the life um, I was living fully, you know, no matter what, because at that point you're in the chronic stage of, of an illness or, or an injury. And I was, had been told, we just don't know if this will ever go away. And so those symptoms were still there. I was relating to them differently um, because of some different practices I was introduced to. But I was also looking for new ways all the time to um, deal with the light sensitivity. And particularly where the hand pan comes in is with um, sensitivity to sound. So I somehow after the accident experienced loud, loud ringing in my head, actually it was hot. I would wake up in the middle of the night feeling like there was, like it was burning inside of my head between my ears and be so loud that I would ask people, do you hear that? Like a siren going off. And I was trying to manage that particular symptom. And I had lots of different practices for, you know, listening to all the sounds and going deep into that sound and finding the center of it. And those are very helpful but I was looking for something else as well. Lots of good medicine out there. So I found these Tibetan singing bowls. I don't know how I found those. And I ended up buying one. And so I was I was playing the singing bowl all the time. And I'd put water in it and play it that way. And, and I would move it all around my body and play it and hold it around my head. And I was showing everybody, look at the singing bowl. Because it actually it seemed to... Um, it seemed to actually resonate inside of my body in really interesting ways. And especially when I move it down to like my chest, um, but around my head, it was almost like a massage. So I don't know how long I had the singing bowl. It wasn't very long. And I think I'd mastered most of the techniques I'd been <laughs> shown in the store when I bought it. And I, I was, I went on my phone and I'm like, I put in a Google advanced singing bowl <laughs> techniques or something like that, you know? And so up pops up this guy with dreadlocks and he's sitting in a tunnel and he's smiling and he's playing a shaker in one hand. And with the other hand, he starts to play this thing on his lap and I just wept almost instantly. There was something about the sound that just brought me home. And, and there was, um, I mean, I, I, I like told my wife, my kids, you got to listen to this. You got to see this. What is this? You know, and that began the quest, um, for, um, to, to, to find a handband, but they're expensive. And so that was February 20th of 2018. And we just didn't know, like, do you want to pump? At that time, it really felt like most handbands were at least $3,000. And so we were like, I don't, and we didn't know which one to buy. And then you have all the different keys and scales. And the more I went down that hole, um, but I started listening to a bit of, of handband music, but I could feel it. I could feel it in my body and I could actually feel what it would feel like to play. I had a sense of like what that was going to feel like. I also had really intense neuropathy on my left hand side. And so my left hand, like parts of it were more like a claw and depending on heart rate, I would lose feeling on my left side, inside and outside. And so up to the point of losing vision on my left side. And so I had this feeling like, I think... You know, this, this thing could be, could be really, could be part of my story. I really think it is part of my story. When I heard that pan, and I think it was Daniel Wables, when I heard that, by the way, Daniel, if you're listening, like, thank you for recording it. Because... It, it changed my life. And I just knew whatever he was playing and how he was playing it, you know. And now I know, like, part of his heart was coming through this music that was connected to this pan in front of him. I knew that I wanted to experience that, that there was something about that. And that day I wrote in my journal, and, like, you know, I don't know how, 
Is it really expensive? But I know the universe is conspiring. And someday I will, I will have one. If I could name the texture I felt that day, it was the coolness of um, the cool uh, force of a river. If you were to get in the river and hold onto the rocks and face upstream mm -hmm. and put your head under the water while it rushed over you. That's what I felt. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Love that image. <laughs> <laughs> we were just in the river 30 mm -hmm. minutes ago. Yes. At that point, you really start being obsessed with handpans. Yeah, I started... You know, there there was like some app where you could play a different hung, <laughs> and I would like go through and play, and it, even that sound was pleasing. But it was more of like I could I would dream about the texture of feet, you know, feeling the pan and the balance of the fingers and the touch of the pan, and um, I think that like I just that all of a sudden like there was this longing, like there was a, there was a relationship, like <laughs> we it was almost instant. Uh, you know, it's metal, so it was. There's a magnetic quality to it, mm -hmm. and it really drew me in. And I must have drawn it in as well, because in October we met. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and it was really cool that you reached out. I remember. I think I told you I was visiting my brother in London when I got your message, and you reached out, and I think you said something along the lines like, "You don't have to respond. Like I'm not." You just wanted to reach out, and, and I thought that was really cool. Um, I think I reached out because of an episode that you did um, with, um, is it Spiros? Spiros. Spiros. Yeah. So and, you heard that? Uh, yeah, and that happened, like I was listening to that on this like <laughs> incredible journey that ended in Pahrump, Nevada at Jacob Lee's workshop. <laughs> that's it's cool that it was with that episode because this episode with Spiros was so inspired and he had transformation stories to share from his past yes. and from his encounter with the hung um, so yeah if you had to summarize this evolution these past couple of years since you discovered the instrument what did you learn? What did you discover? I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind is just like how much gratitude I have for um, the community of at large, whatever that means. And some specific people uh, in particular, Daniel Waples being the first, like, I don't know why he uploaded that video or made it. It changed my life. And that set me on a course toward meeting a lot of other people who would change my life. And so, as I said, we didn't know. We just were not in a place to, like, put a bunch of money into this thing that we weren't sure if it was, like, would I use it? I don't have rhythm. <laughs> like, I, mean, I think even my wife was like, how's this going to work? <laughs> but she just saw that I kept after it. and But I wasn't willing to, like, just do it without. I just felt like we needed to wait. And that was a That was kind of an interesting thing. And so as we're waiting, um, Colin Folk does a thing where he has a lottery, you know, and if you get, if you, and so Emily had everybody we knew put their name it, we, into the lottery and we didn't get it and was super bummed. Mm. And then he does another one for kids at later. We're like, wow, who is this guy? And at that point I knew of Colin and I knew of Pantheon still, and we were on both of their lists and we would get updates from them. I think that was kind of the only two makers I really was following. And Emily, I didn't even know she did this. She put our kids' names in for the kid lottery. Mm. And we got an email. She got an email. <laughs> I didn't even know this happened. That my daughter Sophia had won. Wow. And I mean, you know, when I said the universe is conspiring, however, whatever language you would want to use to talk about that, like what it, what this all is, is way bigger than me. You know, I, I think so many of us have that story, like whether, it, whether it's a handband or something else, like they're just like things in life that happen. You're like, wow, I just am so thankful. I couldn't have orchestrated this. I couldn't have planned it. And that handband arrived at our door. And, um, I mean, it was, 
it was what I imagined, you know, and Sophie played it and Noah played it and I got to touch it. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> quite honestly, and Colin knows he's like, I mean, Sophia plays it, but it like what that was, was like somehow in the way of, uh, it got to me and it got into our family's hands. And from the very beginning, I started playing it outside. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why. Like, I think I had this thing. I wanted my kids not to be afraid to learn something new. And I was just going for it. <laughs> and so I would play it outside. And within, within, it was really November by the time I got to really start playing it. And I would sit outside on the stoop. And one day a man comes walking by. And we've gotten to know him since then. We live in an area of downtown Boise that's clo really close to social services. So we have lots of friends who are, you know, making their way through life in a different way. And um, he stopped and he's just staring at me. I just kept playing, kind of smiled. And then he came back and he has a little brown bag. And he stood there and I stopped. And he's like, no, please don't stop. So I kept playing. And I mean, at this point, like, I didn't know I have any idea what I was doing, right? Mm -hmm. I was just, I didn't care. I just knew it was like, this feels better. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> did not care and he like comes up and approaches me and he says he said um hi my name is such and such i'm like hi i'm dave and he said can i sit by you and so he came up the steps and he sat right next to me and so i kept playing and i look over and like there's just tears running down his face you know we've gotten to know him since then it was like this something happened inside of him and so i started the more i played outside the more I noticed that um, this thing in my lap wasn't just for me, mm. you know, it wasn't just, this isn't my story. Like I'm watching it happen and I'm a part of it, but it's our story. And um, which is why I agreed to do this. Cause I'm not a super fan of like mm -hmm. sharing it in public ways like this, but it's, this isn't just my story. Uh, there are, it, this is our story. Yeah. This just different content. And thinking out loud about, you know, that beautiful encounter, what do you think went through his mind? I, I have no idea. And I, I guess, you know, it's a, that's a really good question because the more I played, the more experiences I had. And, like, sometimes you would have a sense like somebody was really being moved and, you know, maybe they were, like, texting with someone on their phone and then you know, I did it wasn't about you at all you know or um it's like that you know you think somebody's waving at you and you wave back and you're like it's actually yeah. somebody behind you um and then sometimes I have these I had these experiences where I thought people like just like stop playing you know and then I'd find out later like just loved it so I I am really working not to even try to figure that out so I don't know. Yeah, because it's yeah. confusing. It, I mean, something happened, right? Yeah, and interpreting it is is dangerous because we don't know, and and we you also don't want to set that expectation. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I I know my own response to the instrument when I first heard it. I know yours. I've I've heard countless stories, um, but it's always. A mystery it's always a puzzling thing to witness it's beautiful mm -hmm. um, but it's just it's it's very sacred to me and uh, and curious too yeah I like the word I mean that what a great combination it's sacred it's curious you know you do wonder because there's another person you're connected to and you get a chance that sometimes you get to you get the Intel right or at least what they're aware of mm -hmm. at the time when they're they're telling you what happened. So, I mean, a, a big evolution then was, um, for some reason, I oh, I started noticing like people experiencing it in this way. And so I've, I've always had like this, I've always related to older people. And, and, you know, part of my work is as a therapist. And, and so I'm like, this has really helped my experience. And so, I think I, I was like, I just watched Colin give, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't like, Oh, I need to pay this debt back. It was more of like, just out of a heart of gratitude. Like I'm, I'm going to play anyway. Cause I played a ton. I mean, hours every day because it's my medicine. And so I thought, well, if I'm playing, 
and maybe somebody recommended it. Maybe I could go play somewhere else. And there's an assisted living center. It's all memory care. Uh, literally directly one block from my house. Like if you look at my front door, it's, if you could remove the block in between us, it's the next front door. And so I called him up and it was like a really strange, you know, I'm like, Hey, I'm Dave. I live around the corner and I'd like to come play this instrument. And I'm like, well, that didn't sound creepy. Did it? You know, it's like, who is this guy? And they're like, what is it? And so I said, it's this. And so I like just played in the background and whoever it was who answered the phone, she's like, well, that sounds pretty good. Can you come tomorrow? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that is, they began a a long relationship of uh, playing in different places where people are experiencing um, situations in life that they can't get out of. And that really spoke to me, you Mm -hmm. know, like. Because you were in it. Yeah. I mean, at that point, we didn't know that there was what, what. It was chronic, right? Like this is the the lessons I was learning, continue to learn is that life is only unbearable when we demand that it change and that it is possible to experience peace and joy and love no matter the circumstances. And I I have experienced that in the darkest of days that I've had. It was there that I experienced the bottom that was actually what I was always standing on and those kind of things and i and i i i was felt compelled in not a any other way except like just like the, an overflowing cup to if other people found it at all helpful to be in that to be in those kind of places mhm so tell me about your own discovery of how playing the handpan was actually really good for your brain and for uh yeah, for what you were dealing with at the time. Yeah, so one of the things that happens to a dysregulated brain, a trauma brain, a depressed brain, um, is that you you lose some of the nat- natural functioning of that brain, problem solving, you know, the executive functions. And so you operate much more often in the back part of the brain, the reactive part of the brain. And so um, what the playing the handpan does in a very practical way is it activates, you know, the entire brain. It's what music does. It's not just a hand band. Mm-hmm. But it activated the, the creative side. It also, also activated what would become, like, the, the problem-solving side, the thinking side. And it also helps take the mind offline. And you get in those places where you're just flowing, you know. It's just the mind can rest and the body can rest, as well as what you're receiving in terms of literal measurable frequencies from these notes into your body which is full of different frequencies it's full of water frankly and what happens when these notes hit water and oh just wow you know it just (laughs) the different experience different combinations of notes and chords and then i would hear another pan and be like oh you know wow that stirred my heart what is that you know so that's that begins the quest for um you know other types of of hand pans and even other types of instruments like the didgeridoo that I was like, Oh, I feel that in my body. And wow, that is corduroy. For example, like that feels like corduroy. It feels like that, that the texture, you know, those low, deep rumbling notes together is like running my hands across corduroy. And I feel the rumbling in, in my chest and loosening my chest and opening my throat, you know? And I think that was, that just started like to happen very naturally as I dove in as well as like, I have almost zero musical background and I started playing and I'm like, I'm only, I I can't think outside of this thing that I started playing, you know, a rut, a groove. And so I started doing, you know, some of the online courses and, you know, frankly, like your cousin's course, Mm -hmm. David's course, master of the hand band Mm -hmm. was a, I mean, I don't know. It was, it just came at the right time. It was fairly early in that actually. And, and I, I mean, I dove in like I, it was, I loved it. I loved it. Cause if I experienced a lot of pain in the body, I would often like find something super hard to learn, which was like everything at the beginning. And then I would, it would move attention and energy away from the pain, not ignoring it, but just here's all this other stuff going on. And give my attention to that and you know i'm learning new things and i'm also like 
here's another type of medicine for pain. It's not ignoring it, but it's a way of like learning how to direct energy and focus to something else, not just the pain, not just feeding pain. Yeah. What other aspects of the instrument? You mentioned the community. Like what were your first interactions or trips to visit makers or? Yeah. So um, I think we, yeah, would be, as soon as I started playing at the assisted living center, someone in Boise like posted a, a hand pen for sale. Never seen it before or since. And I think I must've like set my Craigslist to have an auto alert. <laughs> and so this, like I got the alert, like right before I was doing the assisted living center and, and it was like a, it was a, it was a meridian low, low F pygmy or something like that. Right. I didn't know what that was. And this yoga teacher was selling it. And so I just asked her if I could come to her house. And then I talked to Emily. And, you know, at that point, we we're like, this is a road I'm going down. So <laughs> I go to her house and I I touch it. And I, I think it was probably, it was at least 15 minutes before I knew she was, before I became aware that she was still in the room. It was there, it's something about the scale itself and the metal and the sounds resonated with me i was crying and you know she's like i think this is going home with you mm -hmm. <laughs> and she and it was really interesting because she goes i have a price i put online but i have one in my head and she said what's yours and it was the same price you know it was like one of those yeah. wonderful moments where again universe conspiring like this is um this is happening it's our story and it's I'm just getting to be part of it again. And so that really opened up the door. Soon thereafter, my mom was in the hospital. I went to visit her. She said, can you bring your hand pan? And I went to visit her and I started playing and <laughs> the nurses started coming into the room. They asked if they could bring, bring people, patients to sit outside of the room and listen because they thought it would be helpful. And after that, when I, came back to Boise, I started going into the hospital lobby <laughs> and playing because I saw I was like, this is a really, and so I did that probably three times until security asked me to leave. <laughs> and they said, you know, you have to, you can't be in here. Like, and, uh, and the people who were there were like, they were really getting mad at the security guard. They're like, no, he can stay. And he's like, actually he can. <laughs> and I'm like, it's okay. Like if they need me to leave because I need to go through an avenue to be here. So I asked the security guard, security guard, I'm like, well, how could I stay? And so he said, well, you need to talk to such and such. So that began the process of then getting into um, the hospitals and um, like cancer care centers and another, you know, other, other health related kind of situations where people are often not there because they want to be. Yeah. You're on a fast track. <laughs> You're on a fast track with the handpan. Those are profound experiences across the board. It's impressive to, to see your journey in just a couple of years, especially because you're in Boise and you have, I think, a good chance to introduce the instrument to a town that hasn't seen it. Or, you know, like, I assume there hasn't been a lot of uh, street musicians playing the handpan in Boise. You know, like you get to be one of those pioneers in your yeah. town. Well, it's interesting because like, so I will resist fast track language <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because I don't see like, I don't see it as a way to get anywhere. Sure. Yeah. So I, and we've talked a lot about this. Like I think for some people, like that's what it is, you know, like this is, and I think a lot of times you get what you aim for and I'm not, I mean, I'm aiming, I want to, we've, we've talked recently, like the, I want to be the best at this that I can be. But what I mean by that is like, when I see somebody like Nadishana do these finger rolls, I feel them. I don't want people like underneath me while I'm sitting on a stage thinking it's really cool. I feel them. And I'm not saying that that other thing is bad, but for me, I want to know what that feels like. I've had neuropathy. I've had the experience of no feeling and the idea of like 
oh, these little textures, like, oh, what is, what would that feel like? And, oh, if I can move my fingers, and I, I can move my fingers independently on my left hand now, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's been thousands, yes, thousands of hours of like monotonous work to bring those things back online and the satisfaction experience of like freeing those fingers up and having feeling in my hand and like move my left hand all over the place right now is, is, uh, man, it's so gratifying. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. So, you know, I don't feel like I'm going anywhere with it, (laughs) but I guess, but the other thing is like, I just keep experiencing. I mean, I think when you love something, you know, and I have a relationship with these instruments uh, is with the sound of them and I've de- developing relationships with the people who make them. I, I'm just blown away by the, the type of people who make these instruments. And when, you know, I've had the uh, real fortune to have a couple of them built for, um, for me and to be able to work with the makers and say, this is my story. Mm-hmm. Like when you're building this, like, I want you to know where this is going. It's going into settings where people are often, like, don't feel a lot of hope or they feel really anxious or, you know, like, some life has thrown them a curveball. They just found out they have pancreatic cancer or whatever it is or they just found out they're terminal or, you know, working in the vaccination clinics. Like, they're really scared as they're in this 15-minute waiting period that they might be one of the people that don't make it. And so I think it's like meeting these people who are shaping these vessels to invite people into peace, I think, or whatever it is that they need at the moment, like to help them come into the present, to move away from worrying about things that they can't change, to like sitting with something that's beautiful. Yeah, I echo your sentiment and yeah. you know I have so much respect for handpan makers and we need to take care of them because mm. they're possibility makers you know they create oh, a that. possibility that opens a possibility for us and on and on and on just like the simple act of you know Daniel Waples uploading that video yeah. it opened a whole door in your life a whole highway you know? yeah I think about him when I upload anything because I don't really want to. You're always taking the chance to, like, even doing this, you know. Like, I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, I don't want my story to be misunderstood. Like, this stuff is really sacred for me, for me. And, um, like, you, when you put yourself out there, you just don't know how people receive you. And so, but I think about like the risks that other people have taken and like the benefit of them sharing their stories. And I think that's why I'm becoming more, willing to share a part of my life over the last six years that, um, man, there were times I was not going to make it through and was going to choose not to make it through. And uh, by grace, you know, the grace of all kinds did make it through. And some people don't. Mm. And it's it's an incredible act of, um, you know, I guess faith for me to do something like this and for people to put themselves out there when the story is so, so close to home and sacred, you know. Mm. And... So my hat's off to people who do share their stories because it does matter. And uh, the sharing of those stories and their experiences and the benevolence of people like Colin and Jake Murdoch was actually the one who made that pan. Um, the benevolence is, well, it really has changed the world. It's changed my world. And the world that changed for me is interacting with others for other worlds. And that's that's a really beautiful thing. So, so thanks for the strong encouragement to do this. <laughs> it's deep, but when I hear your voice tremble and and you recollecting these memories, I can tell that you come back from a very deep and dark place with you know these past few years of dealing with uh, 
your brain injury and and um and you know i told you in the car uh mm-hmm. on the drive uh to this secret location <laughs> that uh it sounded like you had many lives you had had many lives you did so many different things in different places um but any comments and did i get that right yeah, or did I, I get right no i think you i think that's it you know i mean I, part of me is like well it wasn't that dark it was that dark yeah it was a uh, they were they were talking years we're talking over half a decade and of nonstop experience of pain in the body and spinning and sickness and i think i learned ways of being with that that um I am finding that there are other people who will benefit from the same kinds of helpers um, that I that I met in my path, and who were there for me. And so some of those are just friends, and um, some of them are therapists, and um, some of them are ecstatic dancers, and some of them are. Um, strangers uh, were strangers and some of them are you know hunks of metal that were hunks of metal but obviously like are not just hunks of metal you know they're Mm -hmm. they're shaped and formed out of elements the elements and by by human beings who pour their lives into these things so i would say you know that 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 part of it is like even in the darkest times i was really blessed with moments of light and peace including the moment of hearing Daniel by that inspired uh, moment that he had and I think it was the look on his face and you know you hear so many people say that but it was just I saw joy and I think my intention in this part of my life is uh, my mom had this thing she said um, it's actually from a psalm it's from Psalm 90 And having kids, I can only imagine what it was like for her to watch me go through this. Um, And she, I found out this last year that there's a phrase in that song um, of David. And basically it says that your years of trouble will be transformed into decades of delight. Mm -hmm. And so... I am in the season of um, my a lot of my symptoms are still here, but I'm in the season of accepting joy in places where I didn't expect it, and living in that place, and uh, and expecting it too. Well, you shine that <laughs> light. You exude that joy and peace. The theme of hope is one that I haven't heard often being associated to a musical instrument. Um, you know, if you, if you dream out loud, what role do you envision these instruments will play in your life over the years, over the decades with your kids? Yeah, that's easy. So... The same love and joy I had, like the moment I put Colin's ether on my lap, is the same love and joy I have I, when I put these on my lap. And I never intended for it to go anywhere. Um, I just enjoyed it. Enjoy, right? It's that theme of joy. Enjoyed. I went into the joy of this instrument and I'm going to keep doing that. And I've, one of my intentions is to block out the things that would impede that. And so whatever that, whatever that is, um, that's already meant saying no to interviews (laughs) because they didn't fit and they didn't, it, the story is important to me because I, it's like I said, it's not my story. And the more often I share this story of, the last six years, I'm like, well, this is just a story of a human going through something all humans go through. And a human who got, was blessed enough to find some medicine in the form of music and 
people and different practices that are many thousands years old that help us to live full lives and awakened lives. You know, like what I mean by that is like, I'm going to be with all the things that are here today with me. Mm. I'm going to be with the darkness, but in that darkness, you also, there's light there. It's there and you see it and with fear and then there's peace and anxiety and there's calm and hot and cold. And you think of all these things that meet us every day and they meet us in our bodies and in our spirits and our emotions learning to be with those balances that's that's i think you know it's going forward whatever doesn't f- <laughs> i will bring the opportunities into that space and uh, wherever they meet with whatever opposite that, that is and whatever wisdom comes uh in that moment i'll go with it but i don't i, I just know i love it I love playing it. I love the people I've gotten to meet, like yourself. Like the, um, I can't imagine not knowing now, in the time we're spending here, um, meeting Jacob in his um, shop in Pahrump, Nevada, and being healed of a migraine when I played a pan that no one had ever seen before. No one even knew it existed that he had done that. And I'm sitting playing it, and it just like grabs my head and pulls it to the, <laughs> to its notes, and I spend the next days breathing that tone in and out of my body. And Jacob created that in the desert, you know, and uh, little did he know that that pan would be part of some really sacred moments with people um, over the next few years. So I'm going to continue to say yes Mm -hmm. to life and also to stay grounded in what this means to me. And and it's weird because, yes, protect it, but also but also share it. Those are words of wisdom. (laughs) Stay grounded to what it means to you. I mean, for me, it reminds me of the tagline for the podcast, you know, the simple joy of creating. Hmm. To me, that's what it was all about. And that's the lighthouse that I look to when I get too caught up in the politics of what's happening in the handpin world right now with all the lawsuits and litigations or the who's up, who's down, who's in, who's out. Mm. Um, the hierarchy, you know, of any human group, the simple joy of creating. We've been experiencing a lot of that over the past (laughs) couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, there's one thing I want to add. Sure. That we're sh- as we're sharing, as you're ending, that I think is really important for me to share. And it's this idea of um, that you're not alone. So here's how it fits. It, it, when you are experiencing something where like darkness is over, you, you can feel really alone. And th- there are moments that break through that. And so I think there is there is really a part of like what happens in a handpan. I mean, you think about like the physics of the the notes that not, none of it is happening in isolation. You touch that note and it is ex- all these things are connected. And so I think there's an interconnectedness that happens with this instrument that um, it helped integrate my insides, like literally it helped connect mind and body. And it also is like this metaphor that um, I'm not alone and very practically has connected me to other humans who have found this art form. And I think in our time, after this last year, there is a lot of sense of being alone and wondering where you fit. And there's a sense of like, well, I'm a solo note over here, but we're not. It might feel like it for a moment, but there's something more at work. And 
Yeah. I don't, I just, I was weird. I, I don't even know. Like it had no intention to share that, but there was feeling uh, some being compelled, like, cause that was, that was another part of it. Like that is, it seems poignant. <laughs> and that's where I commend you for, for being proactive and reaching out and, and making those connections. Um, the hand pan community. So in the past couple of years, that's a term that's been kind of deconstructed. Like it's a global scattered community. Is there really a hand pan community anymore? Well, maybe you get to define that. Hmm. Like we're just, we're spending a week here with four friends, four hand pan friends. Why don't we call that the hand pan community this week? <laughs> <laughs> just a thought <laughs> I like it Dave thanks for sharing your story I can't wait to continue to see it unfold yeah the word of the, of yeah. the week <laughs> yeah and uh, thanks for being in community with well, me and thanks for I mean it's it's interesting you talked about full circles but I know of you because of this podcast mm. <laughs> and so and here we are sitting in a hobbit hole <laughs> that's right man it's been really special to get to know dave over the past couple of years and to finally meet up in person in real life at handpan camp if you haven't heard my other episode about that gathering we did check it out it was really fun, and maybe it can even be a template for something you do in your part of the world. Speaking of parts of the world, I'm recording this from Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. That's the big news I hinted at at the beginning of the episode. I've been invited to perform as part of the World Expo, also known as the World Fair. It lasts six months, starting October 1st, 2021 through March 31st, 2022. It's an immense honor to represent the handpin art form and to share a global stage with 48 other brilliant musicians from around the world as part of the Expo Music Department, led by the truly visionary maestro Harut Fazlian. Expo 2020 Dubai is said to be the biggest event in the history of the world, <laughs> attracting or expecting to attract 25 million visitors over six months. It's huge. It's like the size of a city with dozens of stages and hundreds of pavilions from countries from around the world. And yes, it's called Expo 2020, even though it's been pushed back to 2021 and 2022 because of the global health crisis. I arrived here a month before the opening in order to write new original music, specifically for the Expo, with instruments like the Greek lira, the balafon, the African kora, the oud, the sarod, the gatam, the didgeridoo, and more. All of us are staying in the same hotel. We've had remarkable jams. There's got to be more than 20 nationalities represented just within our group. So it's incredibly exciting. Musically, it's quite challenging. And it's very hot here in Dubai. But it promises to be quite the adventure. So if you're interested to follow along, you can visit thehenpenpodcast.com or sylvanpalliermusic.com or follow me on social at sylvanpalliermusic. All right. That's it for this episode of the Handpan Podcast. Thanks for listening and talk to you in the next one. Mm -hmm.